Hi, I'm Gordon Lamp here with the Real Finds Podcast, a podcast series where we interview key entrepreneurs, scientists, and activists who are shaping real estate and, as a result, our world. In today's podcast, we'll be speaking with Brian T. Bradley. Brian is a senior managing partner at Bradley Legal Corp and an advisory board member of the Asset Protection Council. On the podcast, Brian gives a masterclass on asset protection planning and discusses the costs and benefits of both domestic and foreign trusts. For real estate investors or their agents seeking to better safeguard their assets, this episode is well worth a listen. Brian, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Gordon, for having me on. It's you know it's an important topic. I'm going to try to keep it fun and not legally dense here. And I'm not anyone's attorney or legal guru. You know, we're just going to be talking to generalities, and I think that we're all going to learn a lot today. And I just hope that the concepts that we break down help you and your listeners understand the area of law. Of, that we're going to talk about an asset protection better and specifically, you know, asset protection trust. Well, Brian, before we get into it, um, why real estate? Look, there's a lot of a lot of reasons why people get into the industries that we do, but um, why real estate law and asset protection? Yeah, I mean, I don't really do real estate law. Um, it's just most of my clients who have assets all also own real estate, so it's just another asset class that you can invest in, um, and. Why asset protection? Because when you own stuff, you're a mark, right? The more you have, the more visibility you are, the bigger your red button is. And so we got to make sure that we protect ourselves from people trying to take your hard earned cash and assets from you. So how, how do you get into uh, the law? I, I'm a JD and I decided not to take the legal route. Um, uh, what uh, inspired you to be a lawyer? At first, I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was an injured college, college athlete, wasn't sure what direction I wanted to go. Um, thought I was going to go like become a Navy SEAL, jump out of airplanes and blow things up. Um, and my mom was like, uh, you know, why don't you go to law school? I was taking you know, a bunch of philosophy classes. And she sort of you know, talked me into going into law. And I was like, okay, I'll go. You know, like I don't know if I'll practice law. I'll at least go, you know, and add it as a as a tool in my toolbox. And I just, you know, fell in love with law. Um, and asset protection wise, I didn't get into asset protection until maybe like four or five years into practicing. I was actually just doing a lot of trial work um, and building myself up there. And I got into asset protection from the litigation and trial side of law where most people come in from like estate planning if they even do asset protection um but i just got tired of seeing clients being sued and their lives just being turned completely upside down coming to me after they were already being sued because at that point you're just too far down the rabbit hole it's like trying to go get car insurance after you had a car accident or after your house caught on fire it just doesn't work and, you know, I see a lot of people thinking that they don't need to do anything until after the fact and they just ride lady luck, you know, but that's just wish, wishful thinking or a lot of couple other misconceptions are they think that their insurance will always cover them, which it won't. You know, it's important to have insurance. You need good insurance. I'd even say go get, you know, an umbrella policy. But we're getting more and more claims that are just radically in excess of their insurance coverage. So being underinsured is a big problem or just having your insurance company completely walk away from your claim, especially large claims, right? Like how's insurance make money? They take your premiums and they don't pay large claims. Um, Umbrella policies, same thing. And a big one here really is that they think that like their family estate plan known as a revocable living trust will protect them. They just sort of like cast all this into one category of like, oh, I have a trust. A trust is a trust, right? You know, they're de- but they're not designed to help you protect your assets. You know, they're completely different types of trusts, which we'll break down later on. Um, so I just f- really fell in love with um, obviously like investing, finance, tax law. And with my trial experience, it, it really hits all of the areas of law that I'm really passionate about in one area, as well as in helping people protect everything that they have. So uh, as somebody who who comes from uh, somewhat of a legal background, it it blows my mind, and and maybe this might be my ignorance, but that you do have trial experience, because it's it's very common that people get into it from a wills and a a state's uh, viewpoint. Um, So I, I wanted to touch on that a little bit later, but right now, can we get into talking about what is asset protection from a legal standpoint because i think that's a big word um and uh we're going to try to shy away from uh getting too into the legalese but 
what does that look like for a uh, real estate investor? No, I think that's a, a great starting point, right? You know, what is asset protection? And it's not traditional estate planning. It's modern estate planning. And what we're doing is placing a legal barrier between your assets and the potential creditor, like the people suing you, trying to collect all of your money or wealth before it's needed. And you're going to hit me, hear me say that a bunch of times, like before it's needed. That's it. It's just like a barrier, like a safe for your gold or your guns or your valuables. Anything of value you want to put behind the legal barrier and out of your personal name so that it's not easily attached with a lien or reached. You know, just like the rich. I love this Tony Robbins saying, um, you know, success leaves clues. The rich don't own things in their personal names. Their businesses do. Their trusts do. They just get the beneficial use and enjoyment out of them while separating out the liability side of it. Um, now, I'm gonna, you know, and we'll break this next concept down if we have time a little bit longer, a little bit more, but it's not hiding money, you know, or moving assets to not pay or avoid paying taxes. I get this call all the time. I want to set up asset protection. I don't want to pay taxes. Um, that's illegal. Um, you know, you're taxed on your worldwide income. And if you, you know, especially if you're a U.S. resident. And again, we'll break that down later um, when we talk about if we can like tax, tax havens and fraud. But it just needs to be understood that asset protection is not tax mitigation planning or avoiding paying taxes. We're just trying to protect yourself, your assets from being lost from creditors and plaintiffs trying to sue you and take your money. So when you talk about developing an overall risk, risk management and asset protection strategy, where's the first place that uh, you would recommend starting for most people? Yeah, um, it really depends on where they're coming in. Like, what's their profile? If they have nothing, if they're, you know, um, if they have a few assets, or if they're, you know, I'm a surgeon and I'm investing in commercial real estate, and you know, I'm over, you know, worth over like a million in unex unexposed net worth. But I'll break it down. I think with a really good um, analogy through winter. Okay, um, let's think about asset protection and some key concepts. And the tools that we use with different layers of protections, all right? These tools are LLC, so limited liability companies, limited partnerships, and asset protection trust. Where you land in this scale of asset protection, like I said, depends on your risk profile, your net worth, and what you own and how you own it. Um, now, when we start thinking about winter, when it comes to asset protection, we wear different layers when it's really cold outside. The first entry layer is your base layer, you know, and it sits on your skin. This is an LLC. This is when you're just starting out investing and you have like zero to three properties. Um, your exposed net worth is going to be generally below $250,000 net. And I think it's worth at this point, like what is exposed um, net worth? Uh, your 401k is not exposed. It's exempt from creditors through ERISA protections. Some states like Florida and Texas have really good homestead exemptions protecting the equity in your, in your primary home. So what we're doing is looking at what's not exempt, and then we're trying to protect those assets. So when I'm doing an analysis with a client, I'm asking, you know, what's the value? What's the equity? And I'm trying to figure out what's already protected to what's not. So things that are protected, I'm taking out of the equation. Um, so we're really looking at exposed net worth. Then as you grow and you add more assets and then you hit around probably that like four property mark, that four unit mark, um, you're investing probably in multiple states or you, now you, you have multiple LLCs holding all your risky assets. Um, you're, you're generally probably going to be around like $500,000 to $700,000 exposed net worth. This is when you want to add a mid layer, which is a little bit thicker, like, you know, it's made out of merino wool or it's a cardigan for you ladies listening. This is a management company. We specifically use limited partnerships for this, you know, mid layer. Um, some people use a Wyoming LLC. I can get into the differences why maybe like this show or maybe another one because um, there's specific reasons why. Um, but that second layer is a management company. It, it helps clean up you from tax perspectives, like so you maintain one tax filing. Um, it gives you a little bit easier way to manage all of your assets. And then it allows us to connect the final layer, you know, that outer shell waterproof layer. Once you hit around that $1 million net worth, this is going to keep you nice and dry and warm when the weather is really bad. This is your doomsday lawsuit protection layer. It's your hybrid asset protection trust. Um, what we use is, is, a, is we call it a bridge trust. 
But by layering like this, you're now more flexible and you can adjust to make yourself more comfortable. And now, you know, when a client comes to me or you guys are shopping around, figuring out what you want to do, to keep it simple, I really want you to just remember this acronym, ECCC. You know, you want your plan to be effective. You want to control your plan. You know, the cost has to be reasonable and sustainable for you wherever you're at, you know, in your journey. And you want the plan to be easy to maintain IRS compliance on. Like we can create the most elaborate thing in the world for you. But if you just can't figure out how to maintain the IRS compliance on and keep paying for it to be an IRS compliance, you're just not going to do it. And then it falls apart. So just remember, effectiveness, control, cost, compliance. The more of those boxes we check, the better and stronger the system's going to be. So um, I know you mentioned um, out-of-state uh uh, protection. And uh, I'm curious if you could expand kind of on that in terms of Wyoming management and, and, and some of those some of those more um, uh, kind of in-depth uh, yeah. protections that an individual can apply. Yeah. So that goes to the first layer, you know, right? Um, asset Protection 101, entry-level base layer protection, LLCs. We use limited liability companies as holding companies for risky assets like real estate. You know, so anything that has a key or needs insurance or can go boom, it all goes into an LLC. Now, the issue here is a lot of people are like, where the heck do we set these things up in? You know, right? There's a lot of confusion on where to, where to do this at. You hear about Delaware, Wyoming, Texas, Nevada. Well, <laughs> it really comes down to an issue of just what are you holding and where are you holding it at? You know, and a lot of attorneys who don't practice exclusively in asset protection or even like your CPAs who are just working for your tax mitigation stuff really convolute this. So I'm going to give a couple of examples. So let's say, for example, it's, it's California real estate that you own and you're a California resident. And then you set up a Wyoming LLC and then you go and you hold a key piece of California real estate in this Wyoming LLC. And you're paying California franchise tax on this out of state Wyoming LLC. What you've done is just convert your Wyoming LLC to a California LLC because you're you know, doing business in the state of California. You're paying the California franchise tax. But if you ever have a liability issue in California, meaning like you know, a lawsuit, the judge in California is going to apply California law, not Wyoming law. This is because the judge in California or any other state, it doesn't really, I don't care if the LLC, you know, is like, you know, Tennessee or whatever, you know, or the properties in Tennessee, Florida, wherever. Um, if you if you stick these properties in just a Wyoming registered LLC, what they care is that is doing business in the state, you know, where the assets at. So in our example, this doing business in the state of California is done this big legal word called availed itself of the protection and laws of the state of California. That's the state the assets in. That's the state the injury occurred in. That's the state the damage occurred in. It's going to be that state's laws that are going to apply. You don't just get to take Wyoming or Delaware tort and damage laws or personal injury laws with you to another state. You can't just go buy another state's more beneficial laws. And this is where people are getting really confused on. So the general rule of thumb, especially when it comes to real estate, is you create the LLC in the state that the assets in. So if your investment property is in Tennessee, it's a Tennessee LLC. Florida. Florida LLC, California, California LLC. When we go to the management company, the second layer, then we can start picking better jurisdictions because it's an actual management company. It's not where the lawsuit's starting from. So we can start cherry picking more beneficial charging order protection from there. So that's that's very um, insightful. And so I wanted to double up um, and follow up on that. Um, so why apply that extra protection through a management company? Um, for somebody who's, you know, not a JD, um, who might be listening to this podcast, why is that management company and that layer a great way to protect against some of the, you know, situs issues that can occur on a property, be it in, you know, California, Illinois, New York, somewhere where it's maybe less favorable? Yeah. So for one, you're going to get sued initially through the LLC. You know, because that's where the injury occurs. So the lawsuit initially it has to go through that LLC, the holding company. So we'll just stick with California because I just like beating up California. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also like practice out there a long time. So yeah. you know, like I just I just like like doing that. Um, so it would go through the California LLC holding it. Now you want to start looking at stronger jurisdictions where they have charging order protection. 
that's where you can start saying Wyoming, Delaware, um, Arizona is a really strong one as well, Nevada. Um, that's where when you're having your management company, well, this isn't just a holding company. So when I'm trying to pierce through your veil and hold you personally accountable, one of the easy arguments to pierce through an LLC, especially for real estate, is saying, this is not a business. This is just an extension of you holding assets. It's doing nothing. And generally, nine times out of 10, that argument alone will pierce that veil. Next one, a lot of people are really bad at managing money and financing. They generally funded the LLC incorrectly. They're commingling assets, meaning using business assets for personal use. Like, oh, I forgot the credit card. Like, use the business card and go buy the groceries. You know, like stuff like that. So now you're commingling business assets for personal use. Well, your veil your just got pierced. And that's a problem because now we can come after everything that you have. So what we want now is an actual management company acting like your business, holding all of your assets that you're managing for yourself, but it actually has a business purpose here. That is when we can go and start using stronger jurisdictions like Wyoming, like Delaware, like Arizona. Um, I specifically like Arizona is just as strong with a charging order protection as, as um, Wyoming. And what a charging order protection really is saying is just saying, we're not going to hold the members, you know, fully liable for everything. We're going to limit how much the members of the, like the limited partnership or the LLC are going to be liable for. Some states have really strong ones. Some states like California and New York have very, very bad ones. Um, so that's why we cherry pick states. I specifically like Arizona which is surprising that it's the only state that does this, but Arizona has a specific code 29-222 that allows to do what's called a really legalese term, a unilateral withdraw on demand. What it says is once we connect the trust to the limited partnership and you have a massive lawsuit, like a multi-million dollar doomsday lawsuit, the trust can demand all the assets that the limited partnership owns and then legally disconnect from it. And Arizona is the only state that allows that by statute. You can try to do it being really creative with LLCs and operating agreements, but the problem is you have to submit those operating agreements and lawsuits to judges for judicial determination. So it's basically like, here you go, honor, like, please rule in my favor. Please, 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 please <laughs> like me. And it's a scary place to be. And most of the judges will say, no, this is not what we, this is not what LLCs are used for. That's why we use limited partnerships as the second layer versus LLCs. But then we're still picking strong jurisdictions like Arizona for the charging order protection. So let's say you use Arizona um, and uh, you want that extra little snug layer. Um, is there a way that you recommend typically for somebody who has uh, you know, a larger level of assets, maybe eight, you know, 10 properties um, that are looking to get that real snug third layer going? Yeah, so that's where the, the asset protection trust comes into play. And you know, I think a, a great way to break down asset protection trusts, it might take us a little bit. Um, it just break down what the heck trusts even are, and then do like a, a compare and contrast of them. Because the world of trust, I think people find very confusing because they just link a word trust like ice cream into everything, right? But there's different flavors of ice cream. And so if, if you don't mind, I think we just spend a little bit of time breaking that down so your listeners actually understand that. Look, that I would love to do that. Uh, as somebody who took trust in the States, um, even my eyes gloss over occasionally when uh, I hear some some trust-based information. So uh, can you yeah. break down kind of what are the standard uh, trusts yeah. that, that you see applied in real estate? Yeah. Yeah. So this is that, you know, that, that final layer. This is your bad weather, your outer shell waterproof layer. You know, like we're in Siberia or like, you know, some massive winter storm came down um, during our ski trip. It's the heart and soul of the system. And trusts have been the longest lasting entity of all entities for holding assets. And when they're done right, they're very, very strong. And they can be sculpted to fit how you need them. And they can morph as you need them without dealing with funding issues that you see LLCs and business entities getting pierced all the time. So like, I just love trust. And you know, where creating an asset protection trust is is really important is just like picking the proper jurisdiction that really comes into play. And like the ice cream, you know, Baskin Robbins, trust comes in lots of different flavors and types. The standard 101 trust that everybody's familiar with at this point, you know, started in the 1960s is that family revocable living trust. So a trust don't die. So when you do, and then you actually funded the trust by transferring ownership of your home, the title into it, you don't have to go through the courts and probate. And it just completely changed the landscape of estate planning. 
Then you have, especially common, and you hear this, um, you know, in the real estate world and like in investment shows like land trusts for real estate, they hold your land and then you connect them to LLCs. But land trusts don't have any protection in and of themselves. They're only as strong as the LLC that they're connected to. And we already just talked about how weak LLCs can be. And so land trusts are really just a privacy mechanism. They're not an actual protection mechanism. Then from there, you have higher levels of trust that are called asset protection trust. And this is where I really want to spend some time breaking down the three types. And after this, I think you know 99% of your listeners will know more than you know, I say like all of your listeners will know more than 99% of all the attorneys out there about asset protection trusts. So you can really start drilling them in on some questions. Um, asset protection trusts came into effect in the 1980s, like specifically 1984. They are what are called self-settled spendthrift trusts. All self-settled means is that you're creating it for yourself at the end of the day. So it's created for you, by you, as your own beneficiary. And then they have these very important spendthrift provisions in them. This lets you protect your assets while you're actually living, you know, from creditors um, and not having to relinquish control of your assets. The difference is that they allow you to protect your assets, not just for like your grandkids when you're, you know, passing it on to them, but for yourself, which weren't allowed, you weren't allowed to do in the past. And you are probably somewhat familiar with one type of self-settled trust that I just mentioned, the revocable living trust. You know, many of you have them, your family members have them, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Um, they're the same in that they're self-settled. They're created for you, by you. The difference is that with an asset protection version of this trust, it includes those critical spendthrift provisions. And what spendthrift provisions are is they are the provisions that allow you to protect your assets from creditors, the people suing you, trying to take anything from you. So these spendthrift provisions are the teeth behind it. And for those to work, the trust has to be not revocable, but irrevocable. So it's a very different type of trust, just like chocolate and vanilla. They're, all, they're both ice cream, very different type of, types of ice cream. And, <clears throat> excuse me, this concept of irrevocability is really confusing for a lot of people, um, but it's really simple to understand. Irrevocable means any action, once it's done, can't be undone. For example, once you jump off a bridge, you're off. You know, there's no coming back. There's no one doing it and, you know, and coming back up unless you have a bungee cord. Now, when it comes to the legal world, you know, the term has more nuances to, you know, for interpretation on it, especially with irrevocable trust. So as a starting point, creating an irrevocable trust, you know, it's just like jumping off that bridge. You know, once it's created, you can't revoke it. You know, its purpose and its terms are fixed and they can't, they're no longer allowed to be changed. You can't change them. But you know, this isn't always the case, you know, like in the law, it's like, oh, is it 100%? No, it's not always the case. Um, it's possible to create a trust that's irrevocable, meaning you can't revoke the trust itself, but you still have flexibility in use of its terms, including who the beneficiaries are, how the trust assets are distributed, and even the conditions where certain actions can or, you know, maybe be taken. So what we're doing now is attaching a bungee cord to portions of the trust so that we can modify them later on. And this is known as a flexible irrevocability and courts are completely fine with this. So, you know, there are ways to use these irrevocable trusts and incorporate those, you know, solid spendthrift provisions that allow access to your own money. Like you can keep your own money, obviously, you know, you can um, keep the creditors away from them and we're still removing the risk of the U.S. courts tossing this trust away. And the way we do this is just by using really strong jurisdictions, which we can break down if you want later on, like the Cook Islands with like hybrid irrevocable, um, like hybrid um, offshore trust. So uh, you did mention the Cook Islands and kind of the idea of offshore trusts. And um, I'd love to just take a very short little bit of time on that, because yeah. I think that's, that's something that, you know, People see who are even relatively sophisticated investors and they hear offshore money and, and all these, you know, images of islands and drug yeah. money, at, you know, uh, dashes uh, before them. Um, what is an, like an offshore irrevocable trust and kind of how does that that work? Yeah. So, again, you know, remember, we've got three options of trust, really. We got them domestically here in the U.S. We got them offshore in other countries like Cook Islands. You hear about the Caymans, Belize. 
um, or you can hybrid them together, meaning take the benefit of both of them, the strongest portions, put them all together. So just to clear up for people the confusion, historically, the offshore trust came first in 1984 with the famous Cook Islands. They created the first asset protection trust. I specifically like the Cook Islands the best. They're the strongest. They have the best home court advantage. And the reason is they have this magical thing called statutory non-recognition of any other jurisdictional court orders or judgments in the world, including the United States, with an insane amount of case law through 40 years up to the Supreme Court. It is literally the strongest thing that you can create. Um, they have a, a lot of statutory hurdles um, to break through, to even try to win through there, and no one's ever been able to, not even the U.S. government. Um, so when it comes to effectiveness, by far, you have literally the most effective trust in the world. But everything has drawbacks, right? Remember, effectiveness, cost, control, compliance, effectiveness, five out of five stars. Drawbacks of the most powerful trust in the world, control. You got to be out of control for it to work. Costs are going to be very high, generally about 50000 Compliance is going to be really hard. You're going to have mandatory disclosures. Fact of disclosures is going to be very expensive. Um, and we generally tell people plan about 50, 12, I'd say like ten to 12000 just to maintain annually that trust. So most people are like, well, that's just that great. It's strongest thing in the world. It's a little bit of overkill for me. Um, don't need to spend that cost. So what do they do? They go create a domestic trust. The domestic option came later. It came about 10 years later. Of all places, Alaska started it domestically. Then obviously like Wyoming, Delaware, Nevada are like, hey, this is like our domain. Like, why aren't we doing this? So they came into it as well. So now we have about 19, 20 states with some sort of asset protection statutes. Um, the issue domestically is like, okay, why not just create these domestically? Why not every state recognizes them? California is one of them. California doesn't have spendthrift legislation, like self-settled spendthrift legislation. And they have specific cases, Kilker versus Steelman, that came out and said, hey, we're tired of you California residents running off to other states out of state and creating these out-of-state Nevada asset protection trusts when you're not a resident of Nevada. No, we don't recognize them anymore. That case upheld by the Court of Appeals. We live in the U.S. also. We have the full faith and credit clause you know, of the Constitution, Article 4, Section 1. So we can't just run away from other states' court orders or judgments. What this means is that, for example, Nevada can pass an asset protection statute, which they have, you know, but they can't ignore a California or Washington or Florida court order. So where the Cook Islands can literally just throw that California judgment in the trash, Nevada can't. Nevada has to respect it and even litigate it. Um, and then courts are just now completely ignoring the choice of law clause. you got a really, you know, a lot of cases uh, was Bately versus Mortison, N. Ray Hubber, um, Dale versus Dale. Just a lot of domestic cases um, with good facts where those cases should have been won. And the judge is just completely saying, well, we don't care. We're just, we want, you know, using our magic power of public policy and we're breaching, um, you know, the trust and breach means loss of assets. So what do you do? This is where you hybrid the two together. You create the most strong trust in the world, the foreign trust, and then you domesticate it through the IRS under USC Section 7701. You do this by just naming the client as the trustee and a state domestically like Nevada as the situs of the trust. Now, what you're doing here is creating a bridge. And as long as we have our compliance with the IRS, we, you know, we're staying classified by the IRS domestically. What this means is the trust is now cheaper to create. It's more flexible. You have none of those IRS compliance disclosures and really no IRS tax filings at all because the trust is now actually classified as a domestic U.S. grantor's trust. But now you get all that power of the offshore trust that you wanted to, the statutory non-recognition and all the other um, statutory hurdles in your back pocket. God forbid you ever need to use it. So it's like a hybrid car. We're just combining the best of both. So. I think you've given our listeners a phenomenal deep dive into the basics of how trusts and asset protection works. But, you know, before we get into our final four, I wanted to ask a quick but important question. So if we have a listener out there who's, um, you know, maybe they've got five or six properties and they're curious, you know, how do I start? You know, how do I uh, understand what my potential needs are? Where's the best place to to, to, to start? I would say start by just doing research. You know, for one thing, like I use my, my website more as a, a law reference and legal reference for people. So like just jump on my website, www.btblegal.com. I have tons of case law, lots of educational information, lots of videos um, to watch. 
and the more educated you are in this, then the better questions you can ask the lawyer. And I hope to God when you talk to people, you're talking to a lawyer because now there's um, <laughs> yes, no, yes, I'm into that. Yeah. yeah, like a lot of these, I'll say like CPAs are giving legal advice, and it's like, and when it comes to asset protection, they're messing it up a lot because they're using like S corps, great for tax mitigation, horrible for litigation and asset protection. Or you're going to, um, they're not law firms, they're like um, legal business solution providers, but you're talking to salesmen. You're not, okay, so is this your legal advice? Oh, well, I'm not a lawyer. I can't give you legal advice. Okay, well, I'm, I'm calling for you to protect like millions of dollars of assets. And I thought I'm talking to lawyers, but I'm not. I'm talking to a salesman from, you know, just got off from like, <laughs> law. you know, like it, it drives me crazy. And then the stuff they create doesn't work. And then when you get sued, they're not there to help you represent you because they're not lawyers. So realize when you do this and you want to protect your assets, from the attorney shark who's trying to take everything from you, you better have a good lawyer draft all this stuff up and create it for you. Look, uh, uh, great advice thus far, um, but sadly we're getting into our final four. So um, uh, we'll have to have you back on and we've got to do more deep dives into a couple of these areas. I'm sure our listeners are going to love it. Um, in terms of um, getting into our final four though, which it's something that we love as well. So uh, one of the first questions of the final four, and it's one of my favorites, is where do you see the future of asset protection going? Um, look, I, I know you're not Nostradamus, but you have as much of an insight as anybody who's probably listening right now. What do you see you know, coming down the pipeline over the next 10 years? I see the hybrid trusts, you know, they've been around for, for 30 years. It's not like they're new. It's just not many people have been this involved in their own financial lives and investing in, you know, real estate and all of this. So um, I really see, and our times are just crazy. We see it globally, you know, we're, global, we're a global economic mess. And um, so I really do see the hybrid trust um, coming more into play as people start learning about them and um, a way to mitigate just this the judicial um mess that we're in so they're like you need to protect yourself once you hit that million dollar mark that's where those hybrids come into play so i see more of that happening now so um look uh we've gone to the future we've uh we've predicted uh gotten our crystal ball out but one of the other fun things we like to do is go back in time so brian if you're leaving high school or, or leaving college and you could have given yourself you know one minute of, of advice what would it be uh, if I if I were to give myself be more patient, <laughs> you know, I'm one of those people where I just okay, I want to just I just shoot from the hip and go, you know. Um, so patience is a virtue. I think though, when you're young, you you have less patience, and then you something you learn to develop. Uh, I still struggle with patience sometimes, um, but I, like for me, it would just be you know take a couple of deep breaths and and think before you go. But don't think too much because then you get lost in analysis paralysis. <laughs> you know, like eventually, you know, do your research, make a damn decision and go learn from it, if, you know. Yeah, it's like that book. What is it? Uh, you know, think quickly, think slowly. I'm butchering it, I know. But there's there, there are definitely times in life yeah. to be more patient. And, and I, I certainly wish I was sometimes. But, you know, um, I, I, make, I, a, make, a, make a decision and mistakes happen. You just learn from them. Yeah. Um, and so talking about learning and, and going towards the future, one of the big things that we like to talk about on the podcast is books and, and books that we can learn from. I'm a voracious reader, at least uh, from the audiobook style. And, and yeah. sometimes when I'm trying to wind down at the end of the night. And so I'm curious, Brian, do you have any books that have heavily influenced your life in terms of business or, or just or just broadly in general? I've had so many books. It's like asking a kid in a candy store. <laughs> I, 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 a couple that I really like. I like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cash Flow Quadrant. So the second one, better than the first one because he really breaks down the principles. Um, I like, um, uh, what is it? Um, oh, I can't think about it. The Alchemist is a great personal development book. Oh, yeah. I really like that one. And then a really good, I don't not a specific book but like i like his series is graham hancock in the younger okay. era i've really been obsessed about like what was going on during like the last ice age and now they're finding all these really massive um pyramids like predate the egyptian pyramids like you know and it's like okay well now we're redating the date 
back of like intelligent human life to like 6,000 more years back to the last ice age now. So like I'm obsessed about that right now. Like uh, three phenomenal books. Uh, Graham Hancock is always mind blowing. Uh, yeah. Robert uh, and Rich Dad, Poor Dad yeah, is phenomenal. Sure. Yeah. And the uh, the Alchemist is I know it's my little brother's favorite book, um, and uh, I read it a while back. is phenomenal. Um, but the the most important reason why we have folks on, besides your advice that you've given today, and we have to have you back, and we have to do a deeper dive. But um, the number one reason we bring folks on is influencers in real estate, and influencers in law, and folks who are changing the way in which we look at the world from that property side tend to be in the arena and folks in the arena tend to have the best advice in terms of who else to reach out to. Yeah. And so Brian, I'm curious, who's that next person we should reach out and have on the podcast? I think you should have a really good um, wealth manager or CPA on, you know, especially in today's climate right now. Um, you know, you want to pay as little as you can in taxes legally, you know? So, you know, so I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to double down on you and say, who should that CPA be? And like that specific name? Yeah. Oh, I, I can give you a couple. Like I, 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 I'm not going to give a specific name on who it should be. I can email you a couple people that I have on your show. I just think when your listeners are, vet your CPA, you know, when you're talking to them, CPAs come in different flavors of ice cream, you know, right? So some are going to be very, very, very conservative. Some of them will walk you straight to the line that you want to go to. Um, it's your job to find the CPA that matches you. So some are really good at business. Some are horrible with investing. Some know only investing, but not good with family stuff. So you got to find the right mix and match of what you want, what your personality is, how close to the line you want to go and find that perfect match. Get a good CPA, get a good wealth manager, because the secret of a wealth manager is they'll tell you what to invest for your taxes. Like, oh, we need you to pay less in taxes. Go buy this property over here. You know, then your your good CPA will be able to then go through the treasure code of the IRS tax code and then do their magic. So you really need the combination of both of them. So, Brian, we got one final question, and uh, it's it's one of uh, the most important questions we can ask. And it's if someone's looking to get asset protection advice or looking to reach out to you, what's the best way to do it? Yeah, again, you know, jump on my website for all that educational material, www.btblegal.com. Um, you can email me, Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at btblegal.com. I generally do like a free 30-minute consultation. I'll send out a bunch of, you know, educational information beforehand just so you can start learning about the concepts uh, more in depth. Uh, but those are great ways to reach out to me, and then you can kind of like get an idea where you lie in this crazy matrix. Brian, thank you so much. We learned a lot about the crazy matrix of asset protection today, and uh, we have to have you on in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks again to Brian. We appreciate his insights. And if you enjoy the podcast, please give us a like, a five-star rating, or review. Your comments, interactions, and subscriptions truly matter and help us continue to provide quality guests. You can follow us on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Gordon Lamphere, The Real Finds Podcast. Thank you for listening.